CMQ investors, welcome to the show. This is Chris Franco, and I want to share with you a response that I gave to one of our fellow CMQ investors about waiting for good stocks to go on sale. This is something that's very relevant right now as the market has been absolutely horrendous, but I also think that it has some enduring wisdom that will be useful to you, whether you're listening to it right now or in the future. And just a quick reminder, if you are new here, I hope you'll join a community of now more than 10,000 individual investors. All you have to do is just follow CMQ Investing on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and that way you will get all the latest episodes in your feed as soon as they're released. So with all that said, let's get to it. Thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting the podcast. I really do appreciate it. You know, this has been growing so much faster than I could have ever imagined, and it's all because, you know, listeners like yourself have told other people about it. And I just want to let you know, as always, that I do very much appreciate it. So here we go. Hope you enjoy. Okay, Colt wants to know, is it inefficient to wait for good companies to go on sale? So what I've learned over the years is this. Um, as investors, we tend to be really bad at knowing when is a good time to get back in the market. Um, you know, I know if I had just left, I guess, if I had pulled money out during the uh, COVID, the initial COVID crash back in what March 2020, I'm not sure I would have known like the right time to jump in because it looked like the world was still going to end and continue ending. Um, and I think it's just a reminder, like it's better just to be in the market versus trying to time the market. I think this overall, this uh, this question comes back to that fundamental idea, which is time in the market beats timing the market. Now. Secondly, I'd say, now this is about individual stocks, which is not the market, and that's why we have to be extra cautious here. Um, the individual stocks that you'd wanna wait to go on sale, I don't think that's a bad idea if you know what what it means for them to be on sale. Um, it's very easy to say that, it's another thing to really know. And also consider the fact that they may never be at that point again uh, if they are in fact really great businesses. So just something to consider. I don't know, um, I, without going on for like, trying to find names of companies in my mind that I could tell you that I think might be sort of uh, on sale. I do think that that approach is a very disciplined approach. Um, I remember an interview with Charlie Munger for a, from a while back. Um, I think it was a print interview, but he talked about a friend of his who was watching something like 100 stocks, waiting for one of them, you know, to, for them to go to the, the what he considered to be the right price. And he said, like, that's a very disciplined way to invest. But most people can't do that, shouldn't do that. And it, I shouldn't say can't. I mean, can't, like... Not as if you're not capable intellectually of doing it, but in terms of building up the knowledge you would need to build up and putting in the time to do that where you could invest that way. Um, you know, there's just, and I'm not speaking to Colt specifically on that, like, because Colt could be the perfect person to do this. It's just in general, like, the best advice that, again, is not my, it's not financial advice, but the best advice I've ever taken that I should keep applying more and more, and we're certainly seeing it in this past couple of weeks, it's like, it's, almost always better to not try to pick individual stocks. Like people worry that indexing will get too big. Like look at all of us talking about stocks right now. Like it's not like passive is not going to destroy active in any way where it's at least I don't think in my lifetime. Um, you know, most people still and even the people that are out here really pumping advice about the stock market, most very few are actually saying you should do low cost indexing. But that is the proven way or the I would argue the best way um, statistically speaking, to build wealth for the average investor. And if you do that and you're consistent about it, you're statistically likely going to do better, um, significantly better than the majority of investors, including the professionals. Um, it's just not sexy. You know, it's not exciting. It's pretty boring and it doesn't require, like there's some weird propensity we have as human beings like to want to make things that are easy more difficult. Like I'm finding this with YouTube lately, like, I've got uh, like so much content ready to go. Like it's not hard for me to talk about this stuff. I'm, you know, it's it's actually like part of my process. But then I'll be like, you know, I should. How can I redo this intro? And you know, I'm not sure if I like this watermark. Like I just dr start drowning in the minutia, um, and focusing on things that don't matter, and then getting off the real game, which is publishing content and learning from how the audience responds to that, um, and getting better at the process of publishing content. Um, it kind of use that analogy or use that parallel and look, taking it back to the investing world. Like we don't have any business picking stocks. The majority of professionals aren't good at it. Um, you know, a lot of people, it's fun. It's still fun to like learn about businesses and think about it. I'm not saying don't ever do it or, you, you know, this is just, um, I've done well with certain individual stocks, but it's added a lot, it's added a lot of stress to my life. 
you know, the best investing I've ever done is low cost indexing because it, I don't have any stress from it. I don't ever freak out about it. I just, it's almost like, and what got me to really lean into it, I think was a quote from Warren Buffett. I wrote this down back in, I have a weird memory, so I can remember stuff like this. Um, in 2019, it was dumb money ceases to become dumb when it recognizes its dumbness. You know, we're all dumb money. Like we're all, we're, none of us are smart money. None of us are, you know, algorithmically trading and, you know, like cracking the codes that are, that you don't need to crack any codes. That's the whole point. The code's actually already been cracked for us. Um, it's just a matter if we're going to follow the path or not. And it's not only our fault. We shouldn't just blame us and beat ourselves up here. You know, the investment business, uh, I'd say 99% of it is geared towards getting us to think we need to do more than what we're doing. Uh, cause that's what, you know, that's their incentives. Um, I'm not saying they don't believe what they're selling, but the investment business, it, it's a, in the business of selling us products, you know, every ETF, every, uh, you know, actively managed strategy, every, whatever you want to, whatever you want to go down the list here, it's a product, right? Cause otherwise you could just buy the index. You could just, you know, get the market rate of return or get your share of the market rate of return or do something complicated. Um, you know, I see David says Jim Simons would disagree with that. Well, first of all, David, I don't think you know Jim Simons. Uh, secondly, I know all about Jim Simons. And this is where people don't realize. Like, I, I don't want to sound like a jerk, but <laughs> Jim Simons is awesome. He's an incredibly impressive person. Um, his, but he's a, we're not Jim Simons. And there's no other Jim Simons. None of us are going to be Jim Simons. And his strategy is for whatever it's worth. And I'm not taking anything away from him. But it doesn't scale like... A Warren Buffett strategy. You can't put as much money into it. Not that any of us likely will have the chance to put, I don't know, like a hundred billion dollars to work, but um, you know, there's a, a cap on how much you can invest. They have to investors in his fund have to pull out. I think at a certain point. I, I don't know the details off the top of my head, but um, something worth looking into. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, look, the code to building wealth. Like, if you want to crack the code to building wealth, it's why I call this CMQ, compound money quietly. It's it's compound interest. You know, it's invest in something consistently, systematically over a long period of time and let the power of compounding do the work. Um, you know, that's the name of the game. That's literally how it works. Um, we just tend to overcomplicate it and screw it up. You know, because everyone's a couple bad stock picks from almost almost being sure that you don't do the average rate of return. Um, and that's the reality. And that's that's why most investors fail to get the average rate of return including the, in the professionals as well. Um, so anyway, I hope that's helpful though. CMQ investors, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you're just now discovering the CMQ investing podcast, make sure you, you know, look through the entire catalog of content. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of episodes that have enduring wisdom that should be useful to you as an investor right now and in the future. I know this content has helped me enormously, so I really do hope that it helps you as well. I appreciate you for listening. On behalf of CMQ Investing, my name is Chris Franco. We'll talk soon.